We are sure to reel you in on this episode of The Paw Report. Maybe you've got a large area in your backyard or maybe just a small corner. Either way, you're wanting to build a fish pond. Coming up, we'll get into the particulars of building your first pond, including proper location, size, filtration, and of course, fish. So stay with us. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. And welcome to this edition of the Paul Report. We have a kind of a different topic to talk about today. A lot of times we talk about issues involving domesticated cats and dogs, but today we're talking about fish, specifically backyard fish ponds. And joining us for this episode is Dave Shiley, and he is an extension educator with the University of Illinois. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. You're welcome. You've been a familiar face on a former program that we've done here at WEIU, but a first right. to the Paul Report. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm an extension educator covering uh, Coles, Cumberland, Moultrie, Douglas, and Shelby County for the University of Illinois Extension. And normally I work in uh, the area of local foods and small farms, so I work with a lot of our local vegetable and fruit producers and, and some livestock growers as well. So helping them kind of uh, build Illinois' uh, food network. So you answer a lot of questions, I take it, from not only consumers, but farmers probably too, oh, on sure. a wider range of... Oh, sure. What's your area of expertise? Well, my background is in forestry, actually, and, uh, and wildlife management. So, uh, but I have a pretty strong horticulture background as well, um, and uh, have worked for the University of Illinois for uh, about 34 years. So well, Close to um, retirement. Yeah, I am. <laughs> But you love your job and you I said do. you're going to stick it out for a yes. few more years. That's great. Well, today on the Paw Report, as I mentioned, you know, we usually bring animals into the studio and we talk mm -hmm. about dogs and cats and horses and lots of different things. But, you know, we've had some interest from folks uh, considering putting in backyard ponds. And um, that's another area of your expertise. So we're going to spend a few moments talking about that. But we're going to first start, why do people want to put in ponds? I'm sure you get some questions, you've done some research on it. So why do you think people are interested in, in that particular sure. element? Yeah, so the, a, a, a garden pond, a lot of people look at it, either they're going to want to add some kind of plant features, something different, you know, an aquatic plant garden, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they start, and so there's that group of people. And then there's some people that want to have some fish. Um, in with those plants and then there are some people that just want to add um, a place to relax so they don't want um, they're not really thinking about um, they want more of the uh, listening to the water movement mm -hmm. and a kind of reflective space so there's lots and lots of reasons people put in a you know backyard pond you know prior to this we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about backyard ponds but uh, you were talking about farm ponds and I thought farm pond. So what is the difference between a farm pond and just your average backyard pond, which we're going to spend the most of our time today talking about? Sure. So a, a farm pond might be one that's either excavated, like dug out, that you might see along the interstate, uh, a borrow pit. Um, and then there's a, a back or a garden or a, a farm pond that has an earthen dam where they're collecting the water, stopping the water from moving on down the slope. And those, they're usually a quarter acre or in size or larger. So generally speaking, a, a farm pond's much larger. There's no rubber liner. Uh, it's lined with clay to prevent water movement uh, on into the soil, so. Back to the backyard ponds. Uh, you know, when you're, I guess there's a lot of prep that should probably, a lot of thought, maybe some research that goes into uh, putting in a backyard pond. Let's talk about a space and locale. Mm -hmm. So where would be the best place to put it 
and, and maybe what other sorts of research, and, and I know we're gonna talk about plants and water quality and fish and all of that, but let's sure. start with location in your backyard. Where should you think about putting it? Yeah, so location, you're gonna want plants. Either if you're only gonna have plants only or if you're gonna have fish, you need plants. Uh, so you need at least six hours of sun. Um, if you don't want it out in the full sun all day just because the water temperature is going to get pretty high and if you're going to add fish to that garden pond then uh, the higher water temperature is going to stress the fish. So but at least six hours of sunlight. Uh, you want it in a place where you can enjoy it. Um, you also want to think about safety uh, where you can keep an eye on it. If you've got kids um, in and around your backyard uh, you may need to fence it, but you want, to, want it for you to enjoy it as well. Um, and then, uh, depending on the topography of your backyard, um, you, wanna, you don't, don't, don't want to locate it at the bottom of a long hill where you're going to have a lot of surface water movement into that pond. What about size and shape? Is that something that should be considered? Um, or is that really just more of a, an aesthetic thing? Yeah, size and shape, it, it, the shape of it um, is really a personal preference. So a lot of people put in a formal backyard pond and it may be perfectly round or brick lined, that type of thing. And, and then the other group of people want little, something that's gonna blend into nature a little bit more. So typically a little more um, irregular in shape, might have a water, water feature, waterfall included with that as well. Um, and then the, <clears throat> the depth, if we're going to look at if someone wants to put koi uh, in that pond in terms of fish, then they really do better with five foot of depth. So we're looking at probably a much deeper structure than if you're going to put some type of goldfish or comet in that, in that pond. What other <clears throat> landscaping features do, do people think about? Do they build docks? You mentioned waterfall sure. structures. Uh, you know, is that something that's pretty common or people should think about doing when they're building these? Um, yeah, some people want to, uh, again, it kind of depends on uh, what that person is looking for in that pond, but some people put a small uh, deck adjacent to that water feature so they can sit and enjoy it. Um, listen to the running water. Uh, some people may uh, want to put, if it a, has a pond with a stream connected to it, they're going to construct a stream as part of that whole structure. They may put a footbridge over that, um, you know, water, uh, water feature. Um, and then landscaping around that, putting, planting, not just plants in the pond, but around the pond, especially if you want that more natural feel. Mm -hmm. to your water feature. So. What, what sort of maintenance issues should we look at? Um, you mentioned one of the differences between a farm pond and a backyard pond. Mm -hmm. One thing is a liner. There's mm -hmm. probably a lot of things to consider and also maybe some rules within the area in which you live, some zoning issues or issues like that that you should also think about. Sure, yeah, so uh, let's talk about construction and, and, and you know, consideration. So planning is a really important part. And one of those first steps is really, uh, can I legally put one of these things in my backyard from a covenant in, in your subdivision mm -hmm. uh, standpoint? Um, and then insurance, your insurance company probably should check to make sure that- Didn't think about um, that. You know, uh, is my insurance company like a swimming pool? Do they, are they gonna require me to fence that? Um, have a fence where you can restrict access to young children. Because even if your pond is 12 inches deep, uh, you still have a, a drowning hazard for a very small child. So, um, so insurance, um, and then- um, County zoning yes, issues. Correct. You know, that you probably need to check all that too. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so all those kind of legal things. And then, um, and then the, another, part of that planning process is really is how much is your budget? You know, how much is gonna really dictate, uh, might dictate the size of the pond. Am I gonna do it myself? Am I gonna hire someone to do it? Uh, do I, and the more formal structure you build, you build, then probably you're gonna, your cost is gonna increase uh, substantially compared to a, a little more natural 
um, sh you know, uh, mm -hmm. structure. So. so you don't just, and, and I know this sounds so simplistic, but you just don't get a bulldozer, or dig a hole, and just hope it rains enough to fill your pond. You right. know, you do, there are some maintenance uh, needs and issues that you, you mentioned a liner. Yes. Is that something that is, what's the, what's the um, non-liner versus liner aspect of a backyard pond? Yeah, so um, most most small garden ponds are, are going to be shallow, so the soil just isn't uh, impermeable at a foot 18 inches deep um, and, and not going to hold water, um, so it's going to leak out. So you've got to have some type of liner. So you can use bentonite clay, um, and bentonite clay then, just like a farm pond, they line the bottom and the sides of that pond with blue clay. Bentonite clay is a type of clay that swells up, and you use it in the well drilling business around the casing of that, of that uh, well. Um, a, a, a clay lined or bentonite clay lined pond is probably something that you're going to have a professional do. So the, 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 uh, there's PVC or rubber liners that are available. The PVC is probably not going to last quite as long. Rubber liners last you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, so there is a life expectancy and, and replacement, replacement need. Um, in terms of maintenance, uh, there are lots of lots of maintenance issues, and um, just like in a in a farm pond, uh, but in your garden pond, you can think of your a backyard garden pond might be a uh, hundred to five hundred gallons of water, a, a small to medium sized pond. Um, you can think of that as a giant aquarium, really sure. stuck in the ground. So the same types of things you have to do in an aquarium, you're going to have to do in this backyard pond, except you're going to have some additional things like leaves blowing in and, and um, algae algae uh, from the sun that's and right. all kinds of things yes well once you you know i think probably now let's let's turn our attention to you've got a pond you've you've got the water in it yep. um, now it's selecting fish okay um, so wh what do you need to think about do you just throw some catfish in there or do you throw some bluegill some perch how do you go about deciding what what you want koi you mentioned yes so if you're going to go the the if you really want to have a lot of a, extremely high maintenance population of fish then koi is going to meet your need you're going to be out there all the time testing water the water mm -hmm. quality and uh, changes a little bit of change in ph and oxygen level and nitrate level ammonia level can affect the fish the a koi um, and, and, and possibly cause death. So you're gonna be really busy. Um, the simpler fish, uh, when you look at our game fish, uh, you mentioned bluegill and catfish. And mm -hmm. They Bass. don't, yeah, they don't do quite so well in a backyard garden pond. So, because they require uh, a little more, a little higher dissolved oxygen level. And um, so we're the best fish for a small garden pond or a medium sized garden pond, low, you know, low to medium maintenance, are you know, goldfish or comets, um, or some species of, they're a little more resilient to uh, temperature change, to oxygen change, to ammonia level change, um, and um, much, much, much easier uh, to maintain. In my pond, I have a small garden pond, I have a small pond, it's not very big, mm -hmm. and, um, and so there are, I've got uh, five uh, comets and goldfish that I've had for five or six years, um, and I'm actually gonna do some expansion of my pond this year because it's been relatively shallow. So those fish have migrated every winter into my basement, into some aquariums, <laughs> and, and I'm tired of that migration. Yes. So we're gonna build it a little bit deeper um, and, uh, and keep those fish in there in the winter as well. If you go a little bigger, um, you want your backyard pond to be maybe a little bit bigger, you can go with the traditional game fish like you mentioned, catfish, Bluegill, bass, crappie, do they, are they pretty low maintenance fish? I mean, if you just go and get some and sure. pop them in, or how, I don't know how that works. I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't have a pond. Yeah. But if you catch some and you keep them and, and migrate them into your own pond, is that a good thing, bad thing? Yeah, so there are actually laws that <clears throat> uh, don't, that restrict or make it illegal for you to move fish from one body of water to another in Illinois. 
So let's say you went to um, Lake Charleston and caught some bluegill and you wanted to put them into your pond. That, that transportation is actually illegal. So, but you can buy fish from mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our soil and water conservation district offices uh, have okay. annual fish sales. So let's say you had a quarter acre backyard pond, right? That's actually dug, it has a dam and it has an earth liner. Um, so the, a quarter acre pond, you could put bluegill, catfish, uh, and largemouth bass in that in that body of water. What's the load? You know, I guess we could talk about both. You have koi, yeah. you have some comets. Yeah. What's the fish load as far as depth of water and and width, length of, of your backyard pond? Yeah, so um, a, a general rule of thumb, like I said, koi need that five foot of water. Koi are a little more and they need a, that construction needs to have less um, variability along the side. So they need uh, like a, a five foot deep wall. Um, and uh, compared to comets and, and koi, that, or uh, comets and uh, goldfish that can have a little more variability and less depth. But the general rule of thumb is one 12 inch fish for every four and a half square foot of unaerated pond and a one 12 inch fish per two to three square, square foot area, surface area, um, in an aerated pond. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that aeration increases the capacity, carrying capacity of your pond. Um, and, I, and, and you may add uh, the aquatic plants in your pond or garden backyard pond are gonna help cycle nutrients, remove ammonia that's gonna be harmful to fish, but a lot of people put submerged plants in a, in a backyard pond to add oxygen um, as well. Do you need that aeration. aeration? So do you need a, a fountain or a whatever to, to keep that flowing, keep the oxygen levels where they should be? Yeah, you need, um, uh, the more fish you have in a, in a pond, uh, backyard garden pond, then the more you're gonna be dependent upon aeration. So for example, in my situation, my, my pond it, it was about 125 gallons, so not very big. Uh, about two by four. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a long time, for the first year, I didn't have any kind of filtration system in it. Uh, I had small fish. They were all three to four inches long, uh, five to seven fish in that, in that system. Uh, but I had an aeration. I had a small fountain um, to add some. And, and then I balanced the, my nutrient cycling really were the plants. Plants potted in when we put plants in a backyard pond with a rubber liner, you've got to plant those in a pot um, filled with heavy soil, not, you know, potting mix that's going to float out. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and that, those, and then the roots are going to pull out nitrates um, and, um, and actually the fish waste is going to fertilize the, the plants. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you acclimate fish? Is it same as a fish tank? Um, you just go get them, put them in, or how do you make sure that you're, you're doing that process, you know, correctly before you do it incorrectly mm -hmm. and you're, you've just lost, you know, a handful of fish that you've purchased? Yeah, so very similar to, a, you know, an aquarium. Um, with, a, with a garden pond, you're likely dealing with a larger volume of water. So sometimes you need to add, uh, not only add fish, um, but add water. Um, so when you add water, if you live in town, you have a, and you're on, on a public water system, it's chlorinated. Uh, so you need to either uh, add a chlorine remover to that water or put it in five gallon buckets uh, or a barrel and let it sit there for 24 hours. Allow that chlorine to um, volatilize out of that water and then add the, refresh the, the pond because your, your backyard pond is gonna have evaporation losses, so the water's gonna go down. And, but anytime you uh, add fish or you're doing work and you're, um, you're remo taking those fish in and out, they need to you know, be a little more, be acclimatized to the water temperature uh, and then uh, you know, water quality as well. And also feed, we have yes. to talk about that. How, do we, how often do you feed them? Uh, again, we keep going back to the aquarium. It is a bigger yeah. aquarium, but how often is it daily? And should you change their dietary habits through the seasons if you keep your fish outside, which is sure. probably something else we need to talk about? Yeah, so 
again, the kind of rule of thumb is uh, you're going to feed them daily um, in a pelleted formulation, and you're going to put in feed there that uh, they should be able to consume within 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes there's still a bunch of feed uh, on the water, then you've overfed them at that point. So just kind of cut back a little bit. Um, and then as we go into the end of the fall, there is a little bit different formulation of pelleted um, uh, feed that you can uh, continue to feed until the water temperature gets you know down below 60 degrees. And then w when we hit into the 50s and less, you're going to stop feeding them. Um, fish have kind of indeterminate growth, so they're they're cold-blooded animals, so they actually can uh, they will eat a little bit um, uh, during the winter time, but they're they can survive, you know, without. Should you leave them? I mean, if you have a larger pond, maybe bigger than what you have in yes. your backyard, yep. can you leave them through the winter time outside? Yeah, so it depends on the. You want to make sure that it doesn't freeze, you know, from top to bottom. So. Usually people that have a two to three foot pond in this part of the you know, world are gonna add, uh, put in a tank heater to keep it open. So you get um, atmospheric oxygen moving into the water column. Uh, they still need some you know, oxygen. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna have some planktonic algae that are gonna be growing there even in the winter time. Uh, they're gonna be producing oxygen for the fish. So you wanna keep that open and uh, through a you know, it's a, it's a, it's a small, <laughs> small tank heater. Yes, yes. Well, Dave, we've got about a minute left here. And um, probably as we wrap this up, you, you've given us a lot of useful information, but it sounds like it can be an expensive adventure uh, putting it in. Let's talk about in the last couple of seconds here, if someone's going out, maybe the price range that they should, should consider, you know, have a plan, have an idea of what you want, but also you need to factor in a budget. Yes, and so, you know, for a small pond, small to medium-sized pond, if you're going to do it yourself, do the construction yourself with a, with a rubber liner um, and, and a pump, you're probably looking at at least three, $300 or so, um, and maybe a little bit more, and then plants on top of that. Um, and then you can go on up from there. You, a lot of people put lights in their pond. Um, in and around uh, so that they can enjoy the, the feature the in the winter, in the, in, the, in the evening, so. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for stopping by the Paw Report today. And You're welcome. And filling us in on backyard ponds. And if anybody out there would like some more information about putting in a backyard pond, again, they can call Dave Shiley over at the U of I Extension Office, and he can fill you in on what we've talked about today and maybe some questions that you at home might have that we didn't have a chance to answer. So thank you again for stopping by the Paw Report. You're very welcome. And we'll see you next time right here on the Paw Report. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with the PAW Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. In this Paul Report Extra, it's the dawn of a new era. Surgery on pets is reaching an entirely new level. Doctors in Tampa, Florida are using a synthetic dog to practice their surgical techniques. Anthony Allred shows us how it works. <laughs> Alberta the Pooch's pulse sure does look real. I'm feeling nervous because <laughs> he can bleed to death. And the insides of this ailing canine couldn't be any worse. It has everything from a, uh, a liver tumor that needs to be removed. It's got a liver biopsy site. It's got a spleen that needs to be removed. It's got foreign body in the stomach, foreign bodies in the intestine. But as Dr. David Royal Danielson makes his first incision. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a midline incision um, and we're going to cut into the dog. You should know he's performing surgery on what they're calling the world's first synthetic canine. It is a new day because this will allow veterinary students and veterinarians to become proficient in procedures they might not be comfortable with. This new high-tech dog is expected to help vets get some hands-on experience and save people's pets' lives. 
Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Oka Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Oka Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okavetclinic.com. 